Psychonauts 2 was just released on Game Pass, so I wanted to get a taste of the original before jumping into it. It should be known that I'm far from a platformer aficionado, but the reputation of the original game as an underperforming darling from Double Fine Productions and Tim Schafer led me to want to give it my best shot. Tim Schafer has always seemed really likable, and the art style of Psychonauts really appealed to me. I'm grateful that I put forth the effort because this game rewarded me. I'm very excited to play the sequel now, and I'm happy to say that I can easily recommend Psychonauts, in spite of being a game from 2005 that at times still feels like a game from 2005. There will be moments where that age will be felt, but for the most part, the characters in the world are still wholly enjoyable. I played the Game Pass version of the game on PC, and at 1080p, it's really amazing how well their art style managed to stay relevant. The character models are not conventionally good looking, more like a homely kitten. The imperfections and lumpy proportions make for a lovable cast. When comparing my screenshots from the game to modern screenshots of its sequel, our characters basically remain completely unchanged. It shows how solid art design is so much more important than sheer technical achievement. Based on my preconceived notions of the art style, I assume this was more of a children's game. It's very much fine for a child to enjoy this, but there are some adult themes that'll probably travel straight over the head of a young kid. If you haven't played it yet, then I'll say follow along if you want and check it out if I've sold you on it. The TLDR is I like this game and I can definitely recommend it. In these videos that I make, I spoil the entire game. I'll recap the events with as much thoroughness as I feel necessary or have the energy for. As I go along, I'll comment on what I gauge me or what bothered me if necessary. If that sounds good with you, then let's start at the beginning. The human mind. 600 miles of synaptic fiber, five and a half ounces of cranial fluid, 1,500 grams of complex neural matter, a three-pound pile of dreams. But I'll tell you what it really is. It is the ultimate battlefield and the ultimate weapon. The wars of this modern age, the psychic age, are all fought somewhere between these damp, curvaceous undulations. From this day forward, you are all psychic soldiers, paranormal paratroopers, mental marines who are about to ship out on the adventure of their lives. This is our beachhead, and this is your landing craft. You shall engage the enemy in his own mentality. You shall chase his dreams. You shall fight his demons. You shall live his nightmares. And those of you who fight well, you will find yourselves on the path to becoming international secret agents. In other words, psychonauts. The rest of you will die. <laughs> Rasputin, henceforth referred to as Raz, has snuck into Whispering Rock Summer Camp, which also happens to be a highly classified remote government training facility. At this location, they train young psychonauts, agents that wage psychic warfare on the astral plane. He's caught by the camp counselors, but Raz is allowed to stay, thanks to a compelling speech to Coach Oleander and his demonstration of his gifts. The counselors give Raz a cabin to stay in, but becoming a psychonaut is a dangerous task and it must be undertaken with the parent's consent, and he does not have that. In fact, his dad hates mentalists and resents his son for his psychic powers. His family is a group of acrobats that travel with the circus, and they want Raz to follow in those footsteps, but that's not where Raz's heart is. Because his parents have disdain for psychics, he's likely to eventually be sent home. He has a conversation with Dogen, another camper. That, that conversation ends with this cheery note. They may come for me, Dogen, but they'll be looking for Raz, the boy. What they're going to find, what they don't expect, is Raz, the psychonaut. And, and, and then you'll make their heads explode? No. Do you do that? No. Well, once kind of. But now I wear this special hat. 
Wanna try it on? Dogen is my favorite character he interacts with. I just love this kid. The counselors are definitely intrigued with Rez's psychic powers, and Agent Sasha Nine wishes he could experiment on his brain. Once asleep, the basics of the game are explained to you. There are Psy cards scattered around the world that can be collected and combined with Psy cores to create a Psy challenge marker, which are basically the level up system in the game. The other major collectibles are arrowheads that can be found everywhere and used as currency to buy things at the camp store. In the morning, you get your first chance to explore around camp and pick up your share of collectibles, and then you can take your time and talk to the other kids at camp. I explored and found all the things I could while learning the basic controls of the platforming. Nothing fancy to be found here, but this platforming was fine, and the controls are serviceable, and I like the camp setting almost immediately. The interactions with the other kids are all cleverly written, and all the children are written and voice acted like children. I stumbled upon this scene with Dogen, and I'll leave my original genuine reaction included. I'm telling you for the last time, no! I would never do that. I could never kill everyone. Oh! Hi, Raz. Squirrel trouble? They're liars at all. Whatever they tell you, it's a lie. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> you going to class? Yeah, I'll meet you up there. As soon as I get these guys to shut up. Yeah, Dogen has a bit of a dark side, clearly. This game came out in the mid-2000s, and I was caught off guard about, like, how silly and fun it is. It's still... the writing is still definitely fresh. The charm has certainly remained intact here. I also met a certain camper who is obsessed with tracking a bear in the forest he saw. You, new boy, seen bear lurking in woods? Nope. Positive. Giant, hairless bear? Nope. In Russia, bears much smaller, also more hair. Less lurking. Always eager to wrestle. This one, hide and run. I'll let you know if I see any. Cannot lurk forever, bear. <laughs> Once you've spoken to the campers and explored your heart's content, you can go to Coach Oleander and start his basic training course, which requires that you enter the mental world inside the coach's warped mind. There are several campers warning about how intense the coach is and how dangerous this class is. This is essentially the basic training of the game. Rez's astral projection is inside the coach's mind, and if he's dealt damage or his brain power is depleted, he's kicked out of the mind and back in the real world. This is how most of these areas will work for the rest of the game. Inside, Raz can find assorted figments of imagination, which can be collected all over the place. After collecting a hundred of these, Raz ranks up, and after enough ranks, Raz will learn new mental powers. Also inside the psychic world are different types of emotional baggage. If you find the accompanying tags, you get this satisfying jingle. Yes, even more collectible types. I've never played any of the famous collectathon games like Banjo or Donkey Kong, but I enjoyed the loop in this game where there are a million little pickups everywhere. The emotional baggage jingle definitely incentivized me to search as well. Bobby Zilch, the bully, doesn't like that Raz seems to have ideas to cross a dangerous area and shows him his foot in a celebration we will become familiar with in the future. What? That's what? Yes! Stupid new kid! Yeah! <laughs> the coach's mind is more than a boot camp for teaching you the basics of the psychic world, though. It's a glimpse into his inner psyche. He thinks of the world as a battleground, and his mind reflects that. The coach's mind is essentially the first tutorial area of the game, 
And if I'm being honest, I felt that this went on for a bit too long. Eventually, though, upon completing this obstacle course, Raz finds himself in a back room. Hold it right there, son! Now just what in the Sam Hill do you think you're doing in there? I was just looking for a way out. Oh. Sorry about that. Couldn't think you'd get to the end so fast. Dang, I didn't think you'd get to the end at all. You surprised me out there, kid. Here, you've earned this. Your first Psychonaut Merit Badge. But I'm always glad to see a soldier come back from the field alive. Now, if you'll excuse me, I gotta go back in. I left some good men back there. The coach might be a bit unstable. The other students feel Raz made them look bad in the training grounds, so they want to give him a beating. Thankfully, he's saved by Sasha 9 who wants to do some kind of unauthorized experiment on him. Off the books, of course. After this, I did more exploring around the camp. With your new shiny badge, you're allowed to access more of the camp. There is an eccentric old man who's all over the camp, selling items at the store, doing various janitorial duties and other things. This man does not acknowledge that he's seemingly ever-present. After further exploration, I find an underground lab which is connected by tunnels accessed by tree logs all over the place. You're treated to the scene as you walk into the lab for the first time. Hmm, you finally made it. It's an honor to finally meet you in person, sir. I thought I recognized you in my dream, but I couldn't be sure. Now that I see you in your element, there's no doubt. You're Fort Crawler, the greatest leader the Psychonauts ever had. Well, you shouldn't believe everything you read in True Psychic Tales magazine. He explains that the camp is built on a large Citanium deposit, which is crucial for psycho Psychonaut activities. This Citanium came from a crash meteorite hundreds of years ago, and it helps psychics become more psychic, and crazy people become more crazy. Ford Kroller acknowledges that he's the man all over the camp, but he says he will continue to pretend to not recognize Raz, and he asks that he not co blow his cover. To be of service to Raz, Kroller will stow away in Raz's brain. If you're ever lost and you don't know what to do, Crawler can be summoned with a bacon to give you words of wisdom and give you a poke in the right direction. I left the lab and did more exploration of the camp, finding more side challenge markers and arrowheads. I encountered even more quirky campmates. One of those campmates was a young boy at the lake's edge. Yes. I just... My family has this problem with water. It's a bunch of hooey anyway. Some old gypsy curse about how we're all supposed to die in water. If you can believe that. Oh! I thought it was about the whole thing with the brain-eating fish that walks out of the lake at night to hunt for victims. Well, see ya! Okay, that may be an issue later on. Maybe I could get a boat from Crawler over there. Can I take out a canoe? Mr. Who? You will call me Admiral, son. And no, you can't charter a vessel. Not without an oarsman's badge. I guess I'll return to the lake later. On my way to the lab, I stopped in the lodge and found this band practicing. Hey, you guys are good. Thanks, man. Hey, do you have a lighter? 
because if you lit it and held it up right now, that would be rad. And completely insensitive to me and my issues. Oh, right, right. Oh, never mind. I forgot about the whole fire bad thing for a moment. Hey, why are you stopping? No reason for that other than I thought it was silly and fun. Honestly, as I review my footage of this game, I'm drawn to these silly character interactions more than the overarching plot at times. I'll refrain from simply spamming these interactions over and over to the best of my abilities, but it's also important to leave some of them in, as these characters were the, the biggest selling point of this entire game to me. It made me want to talk to everyone I came in contact with. During this time of exploration, I compiled enough side challenge markers to unlock a side power from Agent Crawler. He gave me a merit badge for pyrokinesis. Crawler takes Raz inside his mind to practice a new ability. Raz conjures circus tents to burn. He explains his childhood was not great and his family didn't approve of his psychic abilities. Now why are you still talking when you could be burning stuff? With that done, no more delays. Time to find Sasha Nine's lab. I follow the map to where the lab should be when I found this kid locked inside. Thanks, I thought I was gonna have to eat my own arm. What is this thing? It's a GPC, a geodesic psycho-isolation chamber. Oh man, cool! Cool? Do you have any idea what this does? Something cool? Uh, no. It's a six sensory deprivation tank. A hermetically sealed metaphysical hotbox. It's solitary confinement for psychics. Nasty. And the coach locked you inside it? Nah, the staff hasn't put any kids in the GPC since the 50s. Bobby threw me in here. Bully and dwarf accomplice should assault own size or larger only. Why even cooler? Perhaps notice gigantic bear with skin where hair should be? I didn't see anything in there. That's the whole point. Hmm. Just so. Empty now. Good luck, small ones. Hey, wait! Our friend obsessed with the bear cracks me the hell up. Sasha gave me a button, and I install it to gain entry to the lab. Sasha wants Raz to use a device called the Brain Tumbler. It sends him to, into the astral plane, which connects the collective subconscious. What this means to us as the player is that this is an area where you can access all the minds that you've traveled to as you go deeper into the game. There are a series of doors here, and you can backtrack and pick up missed collectibles or simply replay sections of the game. For now, though, Raz will travel into his own conscious, self-conscious mind. The first thing encountered is a rundown gypsy caravan, which Raz identifies as where he was born. His mind is some kind of treacherous jungle environment, and he has to follow a strange bunny-like animal into the forest as Nine tells him that most likely symbolizes a primal fear or memory. I love that he literally has to follow the white rabbit. Quick question, if you don't mind, please comment. Does the phrase follow the white rabbit remind you of Jefferson Airplane, Alice in Wonderland, or The Matrix? Or possibly another use of the term. This is just a curiosity to me. Maybe maybe add your age as well if you take the time to do it. Just interesting. Continuing on though. The bunny leads him to a terrifying monster in the middle of the jungle. This is not typical. Thankfully, Agent 9 pulls him out of the brain tumbler just in time. In order to defeat this monster, 9 will have to train Raz to defeat it. However, 9 won't train you yet. It, you don't even have a beginner's marksmanship badge. Come on, get good, scrub. Crawler gives you a learner's permit, but in order to get the actual merit badge, there's something that has to be done. You, Agent 9 trains you by pulling him in pulling Raz into his mind, which he assures you is what an organized mind should look like. He's managed to put aside all clutter in his mind, and he wants Raz to be able to control his own mind as well. Say something hideous and horrible jumps out at you. Something so disgusting that it simply must die. Ah, oh, it's so tacky. I can't look directly at it. But I control those feelings, focus them, concentrate, and release. And the world is a better place. Your turn. Nine's fears are um, 
specific. We fight our first sensors here in Nine's brain. These are what make us sane people shut down thoughts that don't belong. Sensors will be an enemy type you encounter in the astral plane throughout the game. Every enemy, weapon, map, and character is very well considered. When you enter a new mind, a new theme will present itself along with details about the character you are inside of. Unfortunately, in order to get the merit badge Reds needs, it would require the destruction of a thousand sensors, which Nine estimates would take months. The process is slow, so Raz needs to speed it up. He cranks the lever to 11, and it creates chaos in Agent Nine's mind. Rez has to defeat the onslaught of sensors while also shutting off their flow into Sasha's mind. Unfortunately, shutting off the outlet to create sensors has led to a buildup that's completely untenable. It's time to truly earn that merit badge. This boss fight against the Mega Sensor is simple, and once defeated, Sasha gives over the merit badge and would prefer not to discuss his clearly not perfectly maintained mind. With his new power, Raz can face his own demons now. Back to the jungle. Unfortunately, once we get there, we find that there's another roadblock that requires the levitation power. This badge must be earned from Mia, who's backed by the docks. Sasha gives us the oarsman's badge, so now we can get a boat from the Admiral. I also came across more campers going on about their business on my way. Hey, I didn't know you guys were friends. Small Maloof and I have arrangement. Instead of beating up bears, I get to beat up anyone who picks on Maloof. What? Unbelievable, no? And he's not even charging me. A lot of things are gonna change around here, Rasputin. A power shift. Some big figures will be going down. Some new stars rising. For the meek, justice. For the abusers of power, wedgies and Indian birds. Choose your sides wisely. Raz had a strange dream about Dogen and some kind of mad scientist earlier. Brain doctor? How should I know? I'm a dentist! But here's what I do know. If a tooth is bad, you pull it! But my teeth are fine. Yep! Mad brain's got to come out, boy! It's the quickest way to cure what you've got. Insanity of the mind! But I don't wanna- shh, 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 shh. Now hold still. This will only hurt until your brains come flying out. Uh, uh, get back! No! Don't worry, Dogen. At the lake, something is wrong with Dogen. Are you okay? I had the strangest machine-induced dream about you. TV? Well, first of all, Sasha Nine invited me down to his secret lab, and TV? He's completely brainless. The dream was true. Dogen, don't worry. I know where your brains are. They're in... Like this crazy dream thornbush straight jacket tower place. Hacky sack. You go to the TV lounge. I'm on the case. I just need a little more advanced training to prepare. Rez and Lily decide to team up and help Dogen, as they both had the same dream about the brain thief. Before we do anything to help Dogen, we need to help ourselves, and that means unlocking levitation. Into Mia's mind. Mia's mind is interesting. She's a pretty damn good time. It's a big party here, and she's the star of the show. Here you learn how to use levitate while in the safety of her mind. I also found a glimpse into her mind, which had her caring for a group of children that were cl clearly trapped in a house on fire. This persona she has is clearly a coping mechanism for her tragic past. The gameplay here is somewhat akin to a 3D pinball game, maybe? It's multiple levels of traversing straight up while using the powers of levitation. There's another slideshow here that hints of her escapades as a psychonaut and a possible romance with Sasha Nine. Get it, bro? At the finish line, Mio waits to give our hero his levitation badge which Raz can now use in other astral planes. Back into his mind at the brain tumbler, thankfully Raz can now find what was hidden in his mind. Ah! Why are you screaming? All right, I remember. Uh. Ah! Oh, good boy! 
Why, there's that pesky brain. Here's a tissue. Now, don't you feel better, my dear lad? TV? Of course! Right here! And this bad tooth. We'll just drop it in the old garbage chute. Now, don't you solid foods for six hours! Lily! TV! Lily is in danger now, too. Time to follow Dogen's brain down the chute. The brain is being used for some sort of blueprint tank. This fight is another simple affair, but it does have the added complexity of dealing with clouds of smoke that confuse you and invert your controls. I dealt with the tank easily enough, but after it becomes a brain in a cage shooting out some kind of laser, I defeated this boss, but even as a grown adult, I don't, I don't know what this game actually wanted from me on this one. I feel like I, I just, I never figured out what the second half of the boss fight, what I was supposed to be doing. I basically brute forced it. It's at this point when Raz realizes the blueprint was in the white room from Coach's mind. For some reason, the coach is stealing Camper's brains to make weapons, but for what end? Back at the lakefront, Lily meets up with us and confirms that the coach has been broadcasting his crazy scheme all throughout the camp by radio, and this excites her to have a genuine psychic emergency. Jeez, it sounds like you caught a bad cold. Maybe, but listen, I traced the psychic interference back to Coach Oleander's radio. He's been broadcasting his insane plot all over camp in his sleep. So he's really kidnapping children and stealing their brains to make weapons. Yes, isn't that great? What? How is that great? Because this is an honest-to-goodness psychic emergency! And Sasha's not here. He left on some official psychonauts business. Mia left a note saying the same thing! Lily, a deranged man-man is building an army of psychic death tanks to take over the world. And there's no one who can stop him, except for you and me! Oh my god! Let's make out! Uh, what? Sorry, I'm just so excited. Since you showed up, Raz, things are so much more exciting. Sinister death plots, mad scientists, hideous monsters. Make out? How long have I ignored what this camp had to offer? Everything's new to me now, thanks to you. I mean, look at this flower. You mean, like, kiss? How many years have I been coming here and I've never even noticed a cool flower like this before? <laughs> Due to Rez's gypsy curse, following Lily directly down into the water is kind of a no-go. So Kroller gives him access to a bathosphere to go down into the water and something called a dowsing rod to help him find even more arrowheads to buy more things at the shop. Down in the deeps, it's time to face up with the monster. This is my favorite boss up until this point. The creature inhales deeply to suck Rez in. There are these containers filled with nails that can be broken nearby, which then he will inhale. After a few successful attempts, the boss scene transforms into a chase sequence. The underwater bubble protects Raz so long as you successfully stay within it and stay ahead of the monster. After succeeding there, it's time for the next phase of the boss fight. The key here is to get the light bulb end at the end of the lungfish stuck in the nearby oy oysters. Once it's stuck in, then you can wail away at the incapacitated fish. Three times should do it. Turns out this mutant fish was just once a normal fish, and it's been modified to be aggressive by Dr. Lobato, the brain-stealing fiend. Time to do some mind tinkering. That's right. In this mind, you are not Raz, but Gogalore! I'll let these guys tell you. Hey, Gogalore! Down here! Excuse me. Were you talking to me? Ah, ow, my ears! I'm sorry. Ah, oh my god! Ah. Are you okay? He 
she's dead. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. Don't worry. Every member of the Resistance is prepared to die fighting the tyranny of Kochamara. What's Kochamara? He's a giant monster like you, Gargalore. He brainwashed and enslaved almost everyone in Lungfishopolis. That stinks. So, hey, have you seen any other humans around here? I'm looking for a girl called Lily. The government archives might have some information about your young girlfriend, Gargalore. Yeah, I don't know if she's really my girlfriend. I mean, I think she... I only meant that she is your friend who was a girl, Gargalore. Okay, yeah, this is my favorite area of the game. Full Godzilla Run Amok Simulator. Despite the fact that this is my favorite area, I will be more brief in my description of the gameplay, as it pretty much speaks for itself. Just know that it's hilarious. The banter from the puny lungfish citizens gave me legitimate belly laughs at times, and it was a fun power fantasy just being a giant on a tiny scale city. The lungfish hyper enunciating every word reminded me of the old Godzilla dubs. The Lungfish Republic tries to fight off Gogolore with their puny navy, but it's of no use. Eventually, you end up doing battle with the giant evil Kochamara. A battle of the super kaiju. The way the coach, I mean Kochamara, telegraphs his attacks had me cracking up. Mighty Ram Ground Vision! Thankfully, we got a new shield ability that trivialized this fight. Really silly, really fun segment of the game. Gogolore climbs to the top of Kochamara Tower, and the device controlling the creature is finally destroyed. The creature is thankful. To return the favor, Raz can be transported from shore to shore by using a call. When it is your wish to travel across the lake, you may return to either shore and summon me with that. Thanks, hulking lungfish. You know, you really aren't as hideous as people say. You may call me now by my true name, Rasputin. The name given to me by my people. And what name is that, noble lake creature? Linda. What a magical lady. <laughs> yeah, good old Linda. Heart of gold, that one. At the main gate of this tower is a confused looking guard. If we're going to get past this gate, it has to be through the mind of this man. Immediately inside, we can see the paranoia displayed by the man at the gate is demonstrated to be more intense deep inside his mind. He won't stop talking about the Milkman. The story is that the Milkman is dead, but our guard fellow does not believe it. This is one of the more prolonged sequences of the game. Once leaving the guard's house, Raz is in a twisted neighborhood filled with spy drones, assorted characters that are surely not spies, wink wink, nudge nudge, and where even the windows look suspicious. In fact, the only not suspicious character is this here rainbow squirt selling cookies. Hello, sir. I am a rainbow squirt. Would you like to buy a box of my delicious rainbow treats? I would buy some cookies, but I don't have any milk. Do you have any idea where I could buy some milk for my cookies? Ah, creepy man. There are a group of trench coat wearing men holding stop signs. In order to pass these quote-unquote road crew members, you need to find a red sign to fool them. Stop. Road crew workers only be on the yellow line. You guys are road crew workers? Yes. We work on the road with these red signs. I see. Well, do you guys know where the milkman is? Why do you ask that question? Are you the milkman? Do I look like a milkman to you? That information is restricted to the road crew. Please move along. All the town talks like this, and it reminds me of Joe Friday from Dragnet, if anyone's ancient enough to remember that right reference. A similar formula must be followed for several groups of trench coat wearing men. There's a crew fixing the phone lines, one group trimming the hedges, etc. 
Each time you have to find an accompanying item to sneak by them and fit in. Again, I was very amused by this. If caught using the wrong utility for the job, they'll interrogate you about the milkman. Stop. This is a restricted area. Come with us. Who is the milkman? What is the mission of the milkman? Where were you born? Where did you get the red sign? There's something more to this story. Near the graveyard, you find a vault of his hidden memories that shows his name is Boyd Cooper. He was a security guard when he was fired from his job and lost his marbles, and he burned down his place of business. This landed him in a straitjacket. His behavior and his paranoid brain make much more sense now. The trail eventually takes you to the book depository, which, as we all know, is a reference to nothing in particular. There are a group of assassins on the front lawn, and you have to bypass a shooter at the top of the book depository. Once at its peak, you could use Raz's clairvoyance ability that I have failed to mention at this point to use a helicopter traveling through the town. Using that, Raz can see a remote island at the edge of town that seems the likely hiding spot for the milkman. Oh yeah, and that rainbow squirt does this. We don't Freeze! Don't come any closer. I'll never tell you the location of the milkman. Never! Okay, let's all just settle down and talk. Ah! Where is the milkman? Who is the milkman? What is the mission of the milkman? Uh, come closer. <coughs> and <coughs> I'll, I'll tell you. <coughs> Glad I never bought any of those. All this activity is very thematic and enjoyable, but man, it loses some steam in my poor recounting. In another memory vault, you could find out how Boyd found his way to a guard job again, as the coach cleverly hired him straight out of the asylum to guard it at its base. With that mystery solved, it's time to figure out what's up with this milkman. The end of the line is a house with a bunch of the rainbow squirts. Oh, hello there! Have you come to pay for your rainbow treats? We knew you would. Won't you join us in our rainbow squirt pledge of purpose? To promote niceness. To make the world prettier. To share candy with everyone. To obfuscate the true nature of the milkman. To protect the milkman at all costs. Or threaten, threaten, threaten to reveal the secret objective. Go, girl! Protect the milk! I am! Do not follow! The milk is not ready, and you are not ready for the milk! Oh, crap. The feds are on to us, girls. Well, we found the milkman, but the den mother is awful protective. She throws explosive cookie boxes at Raz, and once threatened, turns the lights out and hunts in the dark. Once she is defeated, the milkman arises. He wakes! I am the milkman. My milk is delicious. And the sea shall run white. <laughs> With his rage. I am the milkman. My milk is delicious. Special delivery today. Okay, I can't tell if we actually helped Boyd by entering his mind, but we certainly helped us, as the gate is now open for access. Inside the tower, you'll start finding a, assorted brains from the campers all over the place. I think it's safe to say these are the strangest collectibles I've ever sought after in a game yet. Back at Agent Kroller's hideout, he gives Raz, Raz his speech. 
You're the only one left, son. Can't even make a connection with Sasha or Mia right now for some reason. Sasha said he had some official Psychonauts business. Impossible. I would know it if they did. No, something's happened to them. Rasputin, listen. You're the only one who can stop Oleander now. What about you? I... I can't leave this cave, Rasputin. Not as the Ford Crawler you know. What? Why? Years ago, I was in a terrible psychic duel that left me barely alive. Yeah, I read about that. They said your psyche was shattered, that you lost your mind. But you seem fine to me. Yes, when I'm down here, near the Citanium Motherload, the concentrated power of the Citanium pulls my thoughts together, keeps me like my old self. But if I leave the sanctuary, my psyche becomes disjointed and I fall into one of my other personalities with no memory of who I really am. I'd be no use to you unless you needed something raked or, or marked. Well, you can call headquarters and get help. The Psychonauts won't listen to me. They wrote me off as a loon years ago. That's why Sasha and Mia have to take on all my missions. Headquarters doesn't know I'm the one behind the assignment, so they'd never get approved. But Sasha and Mia seem to be out of commission now. You have to be my field agent, Rasputin. Are you ready? Yes. Good. You have to find where that monster took the girl. And if you locate any of the other children's brains along the way, bring them back to me for recranialization. Understand? Ew. I mean, yes, sir. I could have truncated this segment. But I didn't. You're welcome. The dialogue is that good the whole game. I give back my brains that I've collected thus far, and I return to the tower for now. The end of the path leads to a woman who's giving a speech to her adoring audience. <clears throat> yeah, her grasp on reality is tenuous at best. Time to go into her mind and do some tweaking. The theme of this place is a theater with a star, Bonita Soleil who won't leave her dressing room due to stage fright. The production is in disarray, and its one and only audience member is a harsh critic. Rez is in charge of getting the star of the show back into the spotlight. It turns out Bonita Soleil defies expectations a bit. Excuse me, Miss Soleil? I heard you were feeling bad, so I just wanted to say that whatever you're going through, you're not alone. I used to be a performer myself, and I know how hard it is when... Kid, can't you see I'm trying to have a moment here? <laughs> Sorry, I was looking for Bonita Soleil. You mean the personal muse of Gloria Von Guten, her inner sunshine? The spirit of her youth, yes. That's me. What do you want, an autograph? I'm kind of busy here. This is the representation of the personal muse of Gl Gloria Van Go Guten. <laughs> it turns out that this is the representation of the personal muse of Gloria Van Gutten. Guten? It was Guten, pretty sure. A.K.A. Crazy Lady. The play is showing nothing but the failures of her personal life, so being the one light in the darkness is too much for this character to bear. Rez agrees to add an additional spotlight to shine some light on the scene. This seems to appease Bonita. While going to set up the spotlight, you can find Gloria's mental vault, which features slides from her childhood, showing a harsh upbringing at a home for girls that also explains her obsession with performing arts. It would also appear that her mother was a stern instructor and a harsh critic. Or that was my takeaway. After Rez lights a candle and prepares the spotlight, it's time for the play. Unfortunately, there's a phantom that drops a light down and ruins the performance. The critic in the audience has more mean things to say about the performance, and Bonita storms off again. In order to get up the catwalk and do battle with the phantom there, there's a particular show that you must put on. Rez is in charge of changing the spotlight, which changes the mood. For cheery scenes, the spotlight must be bright and cheery to match the tone, and when the scene goes dark, he must change to an accordingly dark and moody lighting. He's given a megaphone to order the cast to perform which scene as well. What this actually amounts to mechanically is choosing the right scene that allows to, for a climb upwards into the catwalk. In terms of the story, 
all the plays are thematic to Gloria's upbringing. After some platforming, you can encounter another memory vault with further exploration for the fall of Gloria. It depicts her as a successful actress at the top of her game, who receives a letter informing her of her mother's suicide. The last slide is clearly showing her mental break. At the top of the catwalk, Rez finally comes across the Phantom. In order to defeat it, he must light the spotlights using his pyro powers. Once all the spotlights are lit, the Phantom is revealed to be the critic in the audience, surprising no one. Much the same as when you expose the Phantom, defeating the critic takes lighting the spotlights and the catwalk to weaken him, and then wail on him in his weakened state. At this point, I have to admit that several of these bosses had fairly simple mechanics that my adult brain failed to comprehend at first, and I lost to several of these bosses before figuring them out. This isn't a complaint of the game's mechanics. Frankly, it's more of a damning indictment of my pathetic mental capacity. Eventually, even with my diminished capacity, he was felled. Gloria's spirit of her youth has been restored, and now she can see the bright, things, bright side of things again. Unlike Boyd, you can feel you actually improve the life of Gloria. In return, you get her award from the glory days, which will be useful soon enough. Next up, the trail, there are a couple of doofuses blocking the way, one of which appears to be a half-blind kid who won't allow anyone but Dr. Lobato to pass. He gives his description, and it's clear we have to disguise ourselves accordingly. The other individual is clearly another asylum dropout as well. That garb might be helpful for a disguise. Brain time. Turns out Fred Bonaparte is a long-lost relative of Napoleon Bonaparte. Or at least Fred thinks he is. He's locked in a game of strategy that he cannot win, and Napoleon won't release his grip from Fred's mind until he learns to find the love of victory. That means we're jumping into this game they're playing and assisting Fred to get the dub. Fred immediately wants to give up at the first sign of adversity, but that isn't Raz's bag. He's all in. Each segment of the map has a separate task for Raz to accomplish to counter the moves of Napoleon. First, Raz has to recruit a carpenter to build a bridge that was strategically destroyed by Napoleon. Then he has to win the commoner's love over to Fred's side since they have no faith in him. Obviously, Fred needs a hero to storm the stronghold, but in order to get the energy to do so, the French hero requires heroic French food, which means snails in the farm area. You get the picture here. There are a couple of standout segments, like the snails giving an impassioned speech, declaring their devotion to the cause, before finding out they're just French soldiers' food. <laughs> you guys ready? Yes! We're ready to fight for the fatherland! To fight nobly on the field of battle! Our shells are tough, and soon we will cover the enemy with our silvery trails! Okay. Just remember there are many different ways to serve your fatherland. Also, the peasants who join the fight are very certain of their own demise. It's one thing to understand the possibility that you might die in battle, but these guys are certain of it, and I was very amused. I'm recruiting for Fred Bonaparte's army, and Fred really cares. What's the pay? Hey, check out this coin I found. Money! Oh, man! Well, I'm off to die in battle, dear, for an incompetent leader who'll never know my name. I hope you remarry well. More of that negative talk. To this point, I've not spoken too much about the actual mechanical efforts of working through these areas, as it's been mostly straightforward platforming fare, and my interest in this game was for the story and characters. I will note this segment of the game had some of the most difficult platforming for me, and I struggled to make some of these jumps. I'm truly no good at platforming to start with, and I'm sure I likely missed an obvious path or two, but I got fairly frustrated at a couple of the later segments here. This is more of a casual note than anything, as any insight I could offer to any platformer game should be considered borderline useless. Asking for my insight on a platformer, controls, and mechanics is roughly the same as asking a vegetarian how to cook a steak. I digress. We find a couple of memory banks explaining Fred's backstory. 
He worked at the mental health facility that the other boy guarding the door was interned in. He bought a board game to play with a boy named Crispin, and he is shown eating the pieces. He's declared his own state of victory. Another memory bank shows that after many of these losses against his ward, Fred loses his grip on reality, and it obviously cut him deep to to lose to somebody with an intelligence quotient so far below his. His grief caused him to end up as a ward of the same facility, now battling Napoleon forevermore. After all this effort, eventually the community has now stacked the odds in Fred's favor in preparation for storming the castle. With the battle finally won, Napoleon can finally give back control to Fred with the knowledge that he has the gumption required to live his own life now. Almost with the same fervor as Napoleon himself, except for that one day, of course. Go forth and fight all your battles with the same determination you showed here, and your life will be an endless parade of victories, like mine. Yes, well, except for that last one, the one in Waterloo. Mm, I was sick that day. Very bad stomach cramp, let me tell you. That's why I've always got my hand tucked in here, you know? (laughs) You'll find out when you're older. It's uh, hereditary. Now Rez has a jacket and a claw-like trophy. One last piece is required for a passable disguise. Luckily, there's a tortured artist named Edgar in the tower up top. He'll paint a rendering of the Mad Doctor, but he's pretty busy conceptualizing right now. Time to brain invade. Rez is taken to a courtyard where a house of cards is being built. And there's they're built like a tower that ascends to an idealized vision of a woman. Unfortunately, the tower is destroyed before it can ever be fully built by a giant bull called El Odio. Rez goes to find the missing queen cards to help finish the card tower. This is the most visually interesting area of the game. The vibrant color palette combined with the wild Spanish cityscape is very specific and beautiful. The shtick of Edgar's Mind Palace is that Rez has to use paintings sold by street-side artists as portals to open new pathways down the alleys, while avoiding the bull constantly charging down and knocking him back. Once a queen card from the deck is found, a match must be fought against a luchador. Each time the wrestlers have an additional move set. Since there are four queens and a deck of cards, that means four bouts with different luchadors. I was, um... Not really capitalizing on my psychic abilities for the first couple fights, like a darn fool. Once I started using my abilities, like the shield, the matches became trivial. A memory vault found uh, starts a slideshow that reveals what Edgar's real problem is. He was in a relationship with a cheerleader, and he was a star wrestler. At some point, her eyes began wandering to a male cheerleader she spent time with. This broke Edgar's heart. But just as importantly... It caused him to lose all his confidence. Other than collecting the queen cards, another important task is to hire the famous bullfighter to finally take care of this charging bull. The only problem is he will not fight because there is no publicity for the fight. He gives you the confusion merit badge, which allows for the bull to be stopped from his rampage for a moment so a nearby bulldog painter can paint the flyer on the wall. So yeah, done. Now that the match has been publicized and all the tasks are accomplished, it's time for the bullfight of the century. As it turns out, Edgar is El Odio. Duh. Raz is the one who has to fight him in the ring as the proud bullfighter stands with Edgar's lady of his dreams looking on. At the halfway point, Raz tries to talk Edgar out of his rage. You can't let the junior varsity pep squad ruin your life after all. With Edgar in his weakened state, the bullfighter makes it time his time to strike. Now the roles are reversed. Edgar must be defended, and the bullfighter is the new foe. If Edgar goes down, then Raz will be pulled from his mind. Using the new confusion powers, he can be defeated. Dying. <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. We'll win the game some other day. Ah, <laughs> uh, please. Edgar, look at them. They're too pathetic to hurt you anymore. K- 
can't you just let it go? How embarrassing. I can't believe I was hung up for so long over these losers. Um, uh, I, I always loved you more? Edgar's self-esteem is restored. Huzzah! His inspiration has been restored as well. This is yet another satisfying victory like Gloria, where you get the feeling that some real good was done here. Also, you get a painting of Lobato's face. That too. Now you have a disguise that is worthy of tricking a half-blind, insane kid. God damn, we did all that for that? That's really a lot considering the actual obstacle that was in our way. Seems like going direct to Crispin, the blind kid, and brain sweeping him might have been more efficient, but heck, I guess it wouldn't have been as fun. To Time to ascend higher into the asylum tower to confront Lobato. Well, here I am. Up in the tower of an abandoned insane asylum. Wearing a straitjacket, talking to myself. Okay, enough with the disguise. Our foes are mostly rats here and they explode and cause confusion. The setting, well, it looks like an asylum, especially coming from the beautifully adorned streets of Edgar's mind to the contrast of dingy walls and asylum beds. It's very stark. I will say that even in the quote unquote real world here, the architecture of the asylum is very surreal. Some of the spiral stairways reminded me of an Escher painting. After a ton of platforming, you finally reach Lobato's lab at the peak of the tower. Seems Lobato has more help than we knew with brain acquisition. Worthless! These brains are worthless, Shigo! <laughs> Just like the one in your head! No, no! They're nice! They're, they're nice brains, Dr. Lobato! Really? They're too nice! They won't fight! I need killers! I need angry brains! I squeeze them, I poke them, I twist them. What do I have to do to make them fight? Maybe I should try my drill. I'm not going to bring you any more brains if you're going to be so mean to them. No matter what I do? No, no matter what. Not even if I... No, don't. Oh, not even if I no, cook you a little... Doctor, no. A little turtle soup? Nice hot turtle soup. Mm -hmm. Nothing better on a cold night like this than some boiling hot soup. You leave Mr. Pokey alone! Oh, okay. <sighs> you sure? No! I mean, yes! <laughs> all right, all right. Oh, why don't I just go ahead and heat you up a cup? It's made of turtles. Turtles that you love. Isn't that right, Mr. Pokey Love? <laughs> Okay, okay. Well, maybe I'll just make some for myself. Bring me a good brain, Shigo, or Mr. Pokey Loop becomes Mr. Smokey Loop. <laughs> Smokey Loop. <laughs> when you're a dentist, you have to learn to have a sense of humor, you know. It helps to calm the patients down. The cutscenes in this game are perfect examples of why this game is great for kids while still being perfectly entertaining for adults. The voice cast is superb and is amazing today, even more than 15 years after release. Around the corner, we stumble upon Lily, Sasha, and Mia. Sasha, Mia, Lily, Raz, you came! Of course I did. We gotta get you out of here. Look! The coach must have lured Sasha and Mia here on official Psychonauts business and then ambushed them with sneezing powder. They're completely brainless. I know. I saw their brains downstairs. Listen, first things first. I was thinking about what you said about us making out. Yeah? Oh man, I'm so glad he showed up. I was just starting to feel slightly less phlegmy. Wait! He didn't just hear. Ah! Get away from me! Stop reading my mind! Go rebrain Sasha and Mia so they can help us break this lock. 
Thankfully, Raz is a master platformer, so he can sneak in and fetch the turtle, Mr. Pokelope, to get some help from Shigor, the doctor's assistant. here everything's gonna be all right now here's what we're gonna do with the help of mr pokelope we're able to return the brains to sasha and mia and rescue lily unfortunately this celebration is interrupted by coach oleander who wants Raz for his special brain that could make a truly special weapon. The agents beg Raz to stay out of it and commence with a battle with the coach. Lily and Raz finally get their moment to kiss, but it's interrupted by a cascading series of events that lead to the destruction of the tower. The gang thinks that it's the end of the conflict, but they're caught off guard when the coach's weapon emerges, emerges from the rubble. This becomes a multi-stage battle with the Psycho Blaster Death Tank, as I believe it's called. More like the Dead Blaster Tank, am I right? <laughs> Got him. As Rez gets close to the tank, he's bombarded with a super sneezing powder that makes him sneeze out his own brain. Being just a brain at this point, options are limited, so he jumps into the tank with the coach's brain. This melds his subconscious with the coach's subconscious. The coach has a monster in his brain to defeat, just like Raz did. The coach has some kind of weird love of meat. The circus from Raz's past has melded with the coaches, and this world could bestly be described as the meat circus. The first set of challenges requires Raz to defend a young, idealized version of the coach from an onslaught of enemies while climbing around the meat circus. At the top of this, you can find a memory vault that shows Coach Oleander as a child with a pet bunny. Unfortunately, a man dressed as a butcher comes in and takes the rabbit. One might assume this man was his father, and as a child, Coach Oleander was forced to watch his pet get butchered. I guess this explains that Raz isn't the only one with daddy issues. The next gauntlet is very familiar to anyone who played Ratchet and Clank games, as it is basically just a long rail grind segment. Once that's complete, it's time to face the butcher. Once you've done enough damage to him, he throws Raz out of the tent and it forces Raz down to his, face his own inner boss, his father. His father disapproves of Mentalist and wants Raz to prove himself as a true acrobat. As such, the next portion of the game is the longest extended platforming challenge of the game. As Raz completes each segment, his distorted version of his father torments him with scathing remarks. Even once he completes the challenge, this version of his father doesn't believe he completed the challenge without the assistance of his mental powers. Unfortunately, his father has now been talking to Oleander's father, and they combine their compowers. Did I just say fucking compower? Unfortunately, his father has now been talking to Oleander's father, and they combine their powers for a super fight. Once this is concluded, Raz's real father bursts into his mind. Seeing that Raz sees his father in such dark light hurts him deeply. It turns out his father is in fact a psychic as well. He doesn't hate Raz for his psychic powers, but he feared for his happiness. This pleasant reunion is ruined by Raz's mind consolidating the evil versions of the parents into a super being. Thankfully, his father lends him psychic powers to add to the effort. Using this additional power, he can swell to the size of a giant and defeat his final enemy. With the evil versions defeated here, there's no need for this warped mind palace. Rez has defeated both his and Coach Oleander's literal mental demons. This takes us to a scene where the coach apologizes to the camp for attempting brain theft and proves that he's a changed man and he has the CAT scans to prove it. Agent Kroller, while using a backpack made of titanium to maintain his safety above the ground, 
presents Raz with a badge to prove he is well and truly a real Psychonaut. The summer is over and the camp is ending, so Lily and Raz are forced to say goodbye. It's not all bad, as they finally get their kiss. Nothing is so easy, though. There's another emergency. Truman Zanotto, the head of the Psychonauts, and Lily's dad, has been kidnapped. It's time to start the first official mission of Raz's Psychonauts career. Roll them credits. As I stated in the intro, I'm not a fan of platformers. I also don't play games that I don't enjoy. Thankfully, I had no real roadblocks that hindered my enjoyment on this one. The cohesion of the visual art design, the voice acting, superb character work, and great music made this game a treat for me. This is much like the next game I plan to make a video on. It has a strong vision, and it adheres to it for its entire runtime. I cannot express how much I love the goofy character designs. They have that kind of homely charm that makes them beautiful to me. Seems to me that I thought about what could be a fun environment for a level, and then work backwards to achieve a character with a persona that would meet the requirements necessary. It's funny how you learn so much about these characters by entering their subconscious. There aren't actually that many long expository moments about the characters, but you're able to infer so much about them by what's going on in the environment. I think the choices were brilliant. It also makes you contemplate what your subconscious would look like if it was realized in such a fashion. For me, I was imagining like it would be a world populated by giant adults, and I'd have to be sneaking around in a trench coat pretending to be one of them. As a kid, you look to your parents and their friends, and you see them as people who have it all figured out. They know the answers to all life's problems. Now I'm a father. An adult, allegedly. Now I'm here and I realize the truth. I don't have all the answers. I'm just faking it till I make it just like most people. I still turn to my mother for many of the answers to my questions. I kind of feel like an imposter at times. I'm entrusted with my two little ones and I'm supposed to raise them to adulthood now? This is crazy. <laughs> Obviously I'm aware enough to know that most people are like that. Just another person trying to find their way. My point in all this is that a 3D platformer from 2005 made, a con made me actually contemplate all that kind of stuff. To me, it seems pretty special. Most likely, anyone staying to the end of this has watched it because they want to catch up on the game so they could play part two, and they don't have the desire to play the first one. Or, there's someone who's already completed it, and they have a desire to reminisce. If you're one of the former, then I'd say give this one a shot if I've intrigued you at all. As someone who'd not typically play this kind of game, I enjoyed it, and I'd say it's worth a shot. Thank you for all the people who took the time to watch and listen.